Well, I tell people I kind of fell into librarianship. I was at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill studying for a BA in education. And I had to take this kitty lit course. And I love children. And so I was enjoying the course uh, an awful lot. And Dr. Mary Kingsbury said to me uh, at the end of the course, I think you'd be great as a librarian. And so if things don't work out for you, I hope you'll consider that. Come back and see me and I'll be more than happy to write a reference. And so I remembered what Dr. Kingsbury said and um, touched base with her and successfully um, got accepted in their library school program and got a fellowship. And so I ended up being a children's librarian. So I managed to get um, a children's position in the DC Public Library. And the interesting thing about that was um, the branch I was assigned to was the Palisades Library Branch, which is off of 49th and V Street Northwest. Mm -hmm. So it's on the mm -hmm. other side of Georgetown. And um, they had never had an African-American as a children's librarian there. And it was very interesting mm -hmm. to find myself in that particular position. And so I ended up staying with DC longer than the three years because every time I got homesick, I was ready to go back home to North Carolina. DC is such a large system that you're able to then be transferred or be promoted to a position. And it felt like a totally new job and a new experience. And so, um, D.C. was a great training ground for me. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was interesting um, was the fact that I was the first person in children's room of color they'd ever had. And so um, initially, uh, the parents would come in and they would ask for my, the person I had replaced. Mm -hmm. And when they found out she wasn't there, they'd actually leave. Um, then they may come in and they would ask for my, uh, the other librarian, but she was part-time. And so Erica Stokes, who was a really good mentor to me, um, they wanted Erica, well, what's Erica's schedule? But you find that it is with children. And you know, the whole old adage of out of the mouths of babes, the children did not care. And as a matter of fact, I think the fact that I was young um, and I was giving them a different type of attention, then they responded very positively to that. But um, specifically, I had this one parent and she's the one of the few who would come in and if she had asked and then they, she left and then she asked for the other one when she should. Her daughter apparently had a learning disability and I was unaware of that. And she had a project to do and I had pulled the stuff. I had talked to her about considering how she could go about doing the project. It was the mother who came back and let me know that the child had made an A. Mm -hmm. And she let me know that she had learning disabilities and that she had never had an A before. And I think that that was one of the, um, I don't know that she physically went and told others, you know, that it was cool or I was okay or whatever, but that, fact that she came to me and she shared and then it seemed like after that it just kind of went away. Mm. We didn't have any others in leadership uh, positions. I did have some African-American staff working for me. Uh, there were a couple who were um, I had a librarian who was part-time over at the Special Collections, and I had a couple of other staff uh, throughout the system, but, uh, but no, there were no, other, no others in leadership position. And truthfully, I wasn't looking for a job. Um, I was uh, pretty happy in DC. And so I did realize that in order to um, affect change the way I wanted it to happen for the kids, I needed to be in that room. So I needed to work to be in a higher level position. Um, and so when Patrick O'Brien called to offer me the job, 
Um, I was a little surprised and um, I knew who Patrick O'Brien was. Um, Patrick was a major player in the ALA world, in the American Library Association world. I thought that I could learn a lot um, by working with him and uh, so I accepted the job. When I came on board, he said to me, he said, I think you have what it takes to be my successor. And I, my interview was based on trying to do some succession planning. And so I'll do, I'll try to help you with any and all things that, that you need, because I hope you'll be interested in, in um, filling my shoes. And so I was acting for a minute. I was the acting director for a little while. And then um, I got the job. So Howard Smith Jr., I understand, was the library board chair okay. before Louise Forstall. And he was the chair um, in which uh, he, he held that position the entire time that Patrick O'Brien was the library director. And so after being hired, maybe a month or so, um, we were having a meeting and after the meeting, um, Patrick and Louise were, had gone to the side. I had made some, pre I'd made some presentation and they were very pleased um, with the presentation. And so they were complimentary. And Louise said, you know, can you imagine if Howard Smith um, were here? He's probably turning over in his grave. And they chuckled and I was like, really? And they were saying, yeah, um, he, he would not have, have, have gotten this. He wouldn't have understood. So um, that was what that was based on, that they, felt very good that they did not let something like that stand in the way of them, as they stated, you are our highest qualified candidate. So, you know, one of the things that I've done, once I became aware of the story of the city, um, and so, which is a fabulous story from 1939. But over the years, I, I started to wonder, um, okay, so from 39 to 2009, mm -hmm. what in the world, you know, um, took place? And there are still a few individuals who worked for the library system who were African-American. And so capturing or getting a chance to hear their stories of what it was like to work here um, has been fascinating for me. So it's very interesting. Um, you know, one of the first African-Americans from Alexandria that the library system hired was Mrs. Gladys Davis. And I had an opportunity to my career to overlap with Ms. Davis. She was instrumental in making sure that um, others were hired uh, within the, the library. Okay, so when I became deputy director and I was doing the tour of the branches, I went over to the Barrett Library and within the Barrett Library is the Special Collections, Local History Special Collections Branch. And one of the staff there, Mr. George Combs, says to me, oh, you're the first, you know, African-American to serve as deputy director. You know, we had the, the, one of the first sit-ins occur um, in 1939. To tell you the truth, I thought I misheard him. I thought that he had made a mistake. <laughs> and I said, excuse me? And so did you say, and he repeated the time for me. Now, remember, I grew up in North Carolina. So I grew up with the whole thing of the Greensboro city, A&T going down, students going over to the Woolworth um, lunch counter and sitting down and being arrested. And so I'm like, wow. How did I miss this? I've been in the library business for a minute and you're trying to tell me that there is a story, there was a city. So I still had some doubts. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I had some doubts. I just couldn't believe I didn't know about this story. 
So when I was scheduled to go over there and work the desk, um, I got the I got to George and he was showing me and he went and he pulled out um, all of, uh, you know all of this stuff to show me that yes indeed this event did occur in Alexandria and I was just floored. I pride myself on on um, African American history, very interested in it. You know, took a number of classes in Chapel Hill. Um, they were a little ahead of their time at the time. They had an African American studies department when I went there. So I, I, I had had the course. I had never heard this story. So um, I made it my business to every weekend after that, I tended to come down and I would work on, I would come on Sundays because the Sunday staff had not met me and they only worked on Sundays. And so that they could meet me, I would come down and I would visit a branch on the weekends. I'd do that branch for a couple of hours and then I would leave and I'd go over to the special collections mm -hmm. library and they'd pull stuff out for me and I just started taking notes and I created this notebook. And so I had this real fat, you know, initially I thought, you know, two inches was going to be enough. Um, but over the years, so I've crammed stuff and it's kind of fallen all out and everything. But I have this wonderful notebook that has all this information in it about the city. Now that's what was interesting because in 2009, you know, I'm director and I'm thinking, okay, how are we going to celebrate this? And the staff informed me, well, we tend to let the Black History Museum celebrate it. And, and I'm like, why? Well, you know, because the Robinson Library, which is the end result. So the, the Robinson Library is the location that is the current Black History Museum. And so it's part of their history. I said, yes, but it's a part of our history. And it's the events that occurred here that make that happen. So we need to also be celebrating. And I will say, um, George, who was very good about making sure that the, the story was told and everything, he said to me, he says, well, boss, I feel a little funny, this, you know, fat white Jewish guy trying to tell and celebrate this story. And so I said, well, look, I'm the first African-American library director and I don't see how we can't tell the story. I think that they did feel a little awkward because we were on the wrong side um, of the argument. And, but, because I was who I was and they were very supportive of me, then they were like, okay, Rose, you tell us what you want this to look like and we'll do it. And so we did. So we had that five year period to plan. And as we prepared for the 75th, then we decided that we would celebrate it as a system just as we would celebrate the library's anniversary, when we celebrated the 75th, it was not just the special collections uh, branch over in the Barrett Library. Every single library branch in Alexandria celebrated the sit-in anniversary. So we've done a really good job, but where we didn't hit the mark and fell short was we did not involve the families. We did not manage to get, make contact with the, the families, uh, the descendants of the participants. So for the 80th, that was the focus. Mm -hmm. The focus was that we would work very hard to try and reach out and to get the families involved. And we would only do pro the programming at a level in which they were happy.
And so we really struggled to make contact with the families. And then when we managed to get some names and, and everything, uh, convinced a few of them to come and meet with me over at the Barrett Library in Special Collections and just basically let them know, first of all, I apologize that we had celebrated um, this event um, five years uh, previously and did not include them. And one of the things that was what we wanted to, to fix, so sh shared with them how important the story was, didn't know to what degree and how much information they knew. And so just had a, an awful lot of documentation and information on the table for them to look at. They heard me out. Um, I shared that at this point in time that I was hoping to do a descendants panel so that folks could see them and I would, you know, function as the interviewer and just ask them some questions. I'd give them the information in advance and they were on board. And so I'm happy to say that um, the, their support and their willingness to participate, not just that for that interview, they attended some of the other events that we had. So their presence um, was very much appreciated. People would ask them questions. We, so we received a lot of press from that. Um, and so was really proud of involving them. And then one of the really nice things that occurred was the fact that in our research, while there was um, a newspaper article that said the charges had been dismissed, we could not find um, any proof that that in did indeed happen. And so um, through the Commonwealth attorney, Brian Porter, he was successful in petitioning the court to dismiss all charges against those gentlemen. And we were able to give that document to those family members that evening. And it was just, you know, a very uh, touching and gratifying uh, experience. During the 75th, we created an exhibit we are hoping to expand it into a traveling exhibit. Um, and that's where it has a, a, a dual purpose. So if we're able to have it travel to another public library, for example, in Virginia, then that will have the students come to using that public library. It will also challenge that public library to question when did they made their services available? When did they integrate it? And I think that as librarians, that's one of the things that we can do to help do this with the, uh, to spread the story and to help with this, the opening up of our history. One of the things about history is um, it's, it's shaped based on what one is taught. And as I explained, I only knew about the sit-in in, in um, Greensboro. And subsequently, as an adult, I have learned about the sit-in that occurred in Petersburg before that. I, I, Greenville, South Carolina had a library sit-in in which um, Reverend Jesse Jackson was a major player. And so it's all about who's telling the story. Mm -hmm. And so since the story is has the opportunity to grow and change based on the different people who tell it, then I need for our children to recognize that the history I learned actually is still being told. Mm -hmm.